Okay, all right. Well, I'll do the formal proceedings and I'll keep it very short. Um, of course, I've already briefly introduced Anuj, uh, but just for everyone's benefit, Anuj Maheshwari. Anuj is um, a managing director at Tamasek. He oversees investments in the agribusiness, food tech, and uh, the biosciences sector. And obviously, as we all know, I mean, Tamasek is um, a you know, leading force in, um, in this space, not just in Singapore, not just in the region, but globally. And we're seeing uh, a lot more involvement and love the impact and uh, how Singapore punches above its weight, um, thanks to organizations like Tamasek. So uh, really appreciate you taking the time, Anuj. We do have, um, you know, so obviously, you know, we have our charter members um, who are, we are a very tight knit community uh, and really proud to have them all on this call. And uh, we hope to make it very interactive. So welcome everyone from the Thai community. Uh, but we do have a few guests uh, on the call today. So all the way from New Zealand. And as um, I don't know if everyone knows that, but I'm, I, I am a Kiwi um, and I actually do advise the New Zealand Trade and Enterprise. And, I'm, uh, and I've met Brendan before. And Brendan O'Connell is the CEO of AgriTech New Zealand. Um, New Zealand knows a, few, a thing or two about agriculture, but I think there's also a lot of moving pieces in how um, the climate discussions are going to impact the core economy um, and read dairy and dairy farms. So there's there's a lot happening there. So you know we'd love to have you ask and interact question, around questions, Brendan. We have John uh, Sandbrook, who's an uh, who's an investment leader at the New Zealand Trade and Enterprise. John is based in Auckland uh, as well, um, and really welcome uh, some of our other guests. Rajiv, welcome. Um, great to have you on the call. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to, uh, to Michelle to, to kickstart this. Thank you, Amit. Oh, Thank I didn't introduce Michelle properly because everyone knows Michelle is the engagement director at Thai. Let me talk about why Michelle is just the right person to be asking these questions, Tanaj. Michelle is the lead for New Zealand's integrated. What does ITP stand for, Michelle? Let's just call it ITP. It's an integrated approach around agri-tech. So Michelle does know a thing or two about agri-tech. She's very deeply entrenched in the sector. Um, and I think this is a wonderful opportunity for Michelle to pick on a topic um, that she is so entrenched in and so passionate about. So over to you, Michelle. Thank you, Amit. And I'm um, very excited uh, to have Anuj with us. And Anuj very humble, saying he's not an expert, but we all know that he's been in this line for a long time. So Anuj, uh, whatever you have to share, you know, it's, it's going to be inspirational. But let's kick off with you first. Uh, we know that you're an agri-food investor, you're a tech enthusiast, you're, you're a software inventor, a sustainability advocate. All right, well, what have been the highlights for you in, 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 in 2021? Well, you know, uh, uh, Michelle, 2021 has been <laughs> an interesting year for all of us, being still in COVID and, and, and the lockdown here in Singapore. But, you know, the world around us has really uh, moved uh, around technology being a driving force. And also in 2021, environmental issues have come so much on the, on the, on, on the forefront with the COP26 that we are seeing. And one cannot, and, and, and from my day job perspective, investing in agri-food, um, you know, this sector has been at the center of, the, uh, center of a, a, a attention for this. Um, so, um, so, you know, I, I fundamentally believe that we cannot reach the net uh, zero 2050 targets unless there is radical transformation of the way we produce and consume food. Um, and uh, I think 2021, 2020, and the post-COVID era is going to be the, the, the uh, almost the pivotal point at which this transformation starts happening. Uh, the level of investments we are seeing in, in sustainability, sustainability linked is going through the roof. The level of interest from family offices, sovereign funds, big funds is, is very um, heartening. Uh, the enterprise, enterprising new uh, companies, startups, which are coming up with interesting ideas is all sort of creating an, a golden era for transformation in the food system that we that we know that and I see 2021 as the year where it, it really kind of gets to the next level. I know which is quite interesting that you say 2021 I mean we all know and I'm going to be a little bit provocative here because we know that in 2014 you know people were already talking about the greatest challenge in human history can we sustainably feed 9 billion people and we know that in some cases the number has gone up to 10 billion so how can we feed 10 billion 
people on our planet by the year 2050. And then in 2016, you know, there was a push again. And then fast forward to 2021, it feels, you know, one can't help but wonder how much progress have, has actually been made over the last five to seven years. Um, what, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, so, so Michelle, the, the idea of feeding a growing planet has been around for a long period of time. It's not just 2014, it's been there for the last, last several decades. Mm -hmm. And uh, the main, main challenge was as population is growing, can we feed the people? Can we feed people? Um, and uh, to, to a great extent, the food system that we know today has done a pretty good job of, of uh, decreasing the cost of food and improving the availability of food. However, what has happened during the process is this unrelenting focus on cost and um, has made food into a commodity. Now, now think about it, um, you know, something that you eat every day, you know, consume every day, which we put into our body cannot be commoditized. It is a personal choice that people need to make. Commoditization is okay for oil when you put it into your, into your tank, but food is not a commodity. And so what we have seen in the last 10 years is that consumers have, have woken up to the idea that, you know, food is no longer just the essential need. It is something by which they express themselves, who they are, but it is also important for their health and wellness. And I will come to that. Uh, but the real change, really, Michelle, what has happened in this debate in the last three years is the advent of the environmental consciousness. You know, feeding the people and feeding the planet has been around. But the fact that people, and, and it's widely understood that 30% of carbon emissions come out of how we produce our food, 50% of the land is, 50% uh, of the habitable land goes into producing our food. Mm -hmm. um, you know, 70% uh, of the water that we know it goes into the fields to irrigate them when we have water shortages for civil purposes, for, 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 for our own consumption purposes in many parts of the world. And despite this huge environmental part of it, we still have 800 million people who are hungry. In fact, hunger is actually going up according to the, you know, uh, uh, one of the UN agencies, uh, World Food Program, you mm -hmm. know, malnutrition, is actually was declining till two years ago. And because of obviously COVID, it is going up. So there is, uh, you know, if I look at the debates that are happening at the World Economic Forum, the debates that are happening in some of these G2G, uh, you know, uh, forums, we had the World Food Summit, the UN Food Summit very recently as well. This discussion has, has gotten elevated to a different level. Um, you know, governments are now paying attention to it that this is, you know, a bigger issue than it used to be. Mm -hmm. So I think it is that elevation. And, and I'll give you an example, right? I mean, the, the companies, the big incumbent companies like Cargill's and ADM's and all of that weren't, while their mission was feeding the world, their mission wasn't feeding the world for a sustainable planet. That again has changed in the last five years. So all companies who are on the food value chain are now taking very aggressively sustain, sustainability targets uh, because they know that they, today, as it stands, they're part of the problem and they all want to be part of the solution. Mm -hmm. so, so that's what's different in the last two, three years. And, and look, the best example is how much we are talking about these things, how much capital is beginning to go about it. I mean, five years ago, there was no agri-food tech. Uh, you know, there was no startups. Young people were not going into the food industry. Michelle knows this uh, very well. She runs one of the oldest uh, and uh, you know of, of food company i mean how much how many young people wanted to come and talk about you know insect protein and and know what the next innovation is that has all happened in the last 5 years because there's a greater understanding that this is an issue that needs to be solved and it won't be solved without radically reimagining how we do things yeah a lot of the big agri businesses have started to in have started to incorporate the tagline about sustainable development and all things good as well. So yes, that definitely is a big change. But um, 
Coming back to the issue, we know that one in 10 people worldwide still suffer from hunger and malnutrition, but where we are, it's quite difficult to have people care about it, where in, especially in Singapore, you know, we walk downstairs and we can Uber and grab. So that's a big question mark still. But let's talk a little bit also about the challenges. We know that, you know, there's low yield, farmers will need to produce more food on less land, exactly what you're talking about. Waste, extreme weather, even data drought, because farmers need access to weather information. They might not be able to get that. What are some of the other challenges that you have seen, Anush? Yeah, no, look, you covered all these challenges, right? Uh, the biggest challenge is that food and agriculture is one of the contributors to climate change. But think about it, it gets most affected by climate change as well. Mm. So you have an industry and it's, it's, an, it's unfortunately a negative loop. Mm -hmm. You use a lot of resources to produce X amount of food now you need to produce more food in more difficult environmental conditions. So you're going to use more resources to do that. So it's a, unfortunately, we are in a, in a negative loop when it comes to uh, agriculture and the impact of, of climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, you, know, you know, coal power plants are not going to be less productive in a hotter environment or a more volatile environment you know, but agriculture is going to produce less in this kind of environment. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so that's, that's really the biggest challenge, right? Uh, then, you know, you covered all the challenges about, uh, you know, low yields, I, uh, you know, which are, which are there and look, yields have improved. Frankly, yields have been improving at one, one and a half percent every year, thanks to all the genetic improvements and all of that stuff. But what we are seeing is that the resource, you know, the resource use is actually increasing, not decreasing. You know, we are coming, cutting Amazon forests mm -hmm. more and more than less and less. Um, I think the other sort of social aspect of it uh, has two, two sides to it. Uh, one is, uh, you know, as we move more and more towards a, a more, uh, you know, uh, wealthier society around the world, we need to bring the last, the, the last few people along with us. So mm -hmm. smallholder farmers as, in general are probably one of the poorest communities around the world, whether it's in Africa, whether it's in Southeast Asia, whether it's in, uh, in China, smallholder farmers have not been able to find a way to sustain them themselves. And they are just moving more and more towards that to the extent that actually people are moving away from farming to become laborers and all of that. And again, this is nothing has happened in the last three years. It's just been happening for a long period of time. But today, now we have means to actually solve that. So we should be trying to, uh, trying to, uh, solve that. So there is the issue of the smallholder side of it. And then the other part of it is the, you know, you talked about hunger and you're right, look, there are a lot of people going hungry in Africa and all of that stuff. What can we do about it? But what is affecting us is the way our food is produced and the way we are consuming food is leading to a lot of diseases that are coming in. I mean, uh, you know, diabetes, which we all know of, obesity we know of are huge uh, I used this statistic in one of the recent panels I did where one third of the diabetics in the world are in, uh, are, are in China. Uh, you know, uh, Singapore unfortunately has a, a global ranking of number two on the per capita diabetics in yeah. the world. By the way, the number one, just in uh, some Americans over here should uh, want to be feeling proud. America is number one on that uh, statistic, which is obviously not good. And it's not good for Singapore to be number two. Uh, you know, diabetes and all of that stuff is happening because we consume a lot of staples. Rice is very high glycemic index food. And uh, unless we kind of create products which can, which, which move away from that, we're just going to keep on accentuating it. So these are all the challenges. Uh, the, the, the good thing is we can now do something about it because technology is getting developed across all the different uh, sides, whether it's nutrition, whether it's genetics, whether it's digital, whether it is supply chain and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Anuja, I like what you're saying about supply chain. I mean, just thinking about how the global crisis, COVID global crisis results in huge dislocation of the system, right? So 
when it first started, there was lower demand for foods and then decline in availability because logistics and lack of staff and all those issues. And then now it's kind of the other way around. So then this whole renewed demand rolls in and the food supply system is being overwhelmed. You know, container shipping is going out of whack and struggling to cope with renewed demands. So what have you seen in this space and, and what, are the, what is the impact on how we make decisions uh, for businesses? Yeah, look, uh, it's it's leading to few patterns we have seen. One is uh, what is what is called uh, pantry stocking. So at, at every level in the supply chain, there is now just more inventory that everybody is stocking up, uh, which is obviously creating an artificial um, increase in in demand at the producer level and a um, little bit increasing the inflationary effects of it. Uh, as uh, uh, is the is the main sort of effect. So in some way, it is it is um, accentuating the inflation that we see. Uh, across food, uh, but but yes, the core inflation itself is on the on the on the higher side. Um, uh, so so supply chain dislocations uh, are are leading to these higher costs across the value chain. To be frank, I think the food industry by and large has done pretty well in terms of making sure availability is there. Though availability has kind of gone down from the from the last two year uh, perspective. Um, so I, I would say it's really an inflationary sort of trend, which is not good because, you know, when there is food inflation, it invariably leads to uh, social unrest. We saw that in 2011, when the Middle Eastern uh, uprisings happened, they all happened because the wheat prices had gone off the roof and, and so had soybean and corn prices, uh, thanks to biofuel and other mandates that are being rolled out in the United States. Um, the question is this time around, if food prices keep on going up because of supply chain disruptions, because of general costs going up, can we see some form of disruptions uh, going forward? Um, and I think we will see that. I don't know where it will lead to social unrest or, or political upheavals, but those, those things will certainly affect us. Yeah, yeah, certainly quite a scary thought. Um, well, on a brighter note, let's let's look at the innovation solutions that's happening. You know, when people talk about agri-tech, they would imagine, well, first of all, background, mu background futuristic music playing, and then they would imagine this farm to fork kind of a touchless system, foods planted, monitored, and everything picked via AI and robotics. So in, in your shoes, I know you, you must go shopping quite a fair bit for um, agri-tech, food agri-tech solutions. What are some interesting um, innovation that you have seen over the last few years and even this year? Yeah, you know, um, the there is, it, it, it's uh, very interesting, the kind of innovations that are coming across the board. Um, and sometimes I question, why were some of these things not happening earlier? Um, was it that there were not enough investors like us who were looking at it? Or was it that technology had not developed? Um, and, and, and so on and so forth. So, so look, the, the broader side of the innovations are, I would say, in four, five, three, four areas. One is the digital digitalization of the, of the agricultural value chain. These are digital platforms. And I'll talk about some examples to do that. The second one is um, biotech and biology uh, and biological advances that have happened in the field of medicine getting applied uh, to agriculture. They were already, you know, G GM and all that stuff was there in agriculture, but at a faster pace, we are seeing some of the biotech advances coming in. Uh, the third one is, you know, uh, robotics, AI, precision agriculture is coming and hitting the market. And, and finally, I would say uh, we are fundamentally, um, you know, questioning uh, how certain products are produced, you know, the whole space of alternate proteins um, is, is, is an area of great interest and very, very interesting sort of solutions are coming out of it. So I'll give you some examples on, the, on just the kind of companies we are seeing and how they're changing the world. Um, so on the, on, the digital, uh, on, the, on the digital side, we've all heard of platform companies which are, um, which are setting up these apps, marketplaces, uh, mm -hmm. being able to sell inputs to farmers, um, you know, provide weather information, provide digital sort of uh, uh, financing solutions through platforms and disintermediate the supply chain by going directly to a farmer, connecting the end producer, removing the friction in the system 
uh, and and helping create this level playing field uh, with that. Um, you know, um, we have invested in a company called Farmers Business Network in the U.S., uh, which is which which started in 2014. Uh, you know, uh, the company's crossed $500 million of revenue uh, last year. Uh, we are seeing this very nice sort of feedback loop in terms of farmers buying inputs, getting okay. advice, uh, and then selling outputs or buying certain things around outputs through a connected app. But what the, the best thing about it is because input and output are on the same platform of financiers and, 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 and uh, see a lot of value in providing financing solutions because now they have so lower so much lower risk because what you are selling as input you can also see output with a six months or a three month gap whatever the growing cycle is uh, and these kinds of models have been morphed and and and, and brought to uh, asia and other places as well so that's one group of uh, innovation the second side of it is the biotech side of it uh, my my you know uh, we have uh, invested in a company called pivot bio uh, in the US and allow me to explain what this company does. Um, you know, so we spray fertilizers because crops need fertilizers. Um, however, you know, most of us uh, uh, learned in our, uh, in our chemistry classes in, uh, in, 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 in junior school that 78% of our atmosphere is nitrogen. So 92, 7 to 8% of the air around us is nitrogen, but we are spraying ammonia uh, uh, which is going to crops to give them nitrogen. And then this ammonia has a big, has two issues. One, it's a very highly energy uh, consuming process to produce ammonia. But the second thing is this ammonia then runs off into our, our waters and creates a huge issue with biodiversity, with fish populations, algae populations, and so on and so forth. So across the board, this whole system is just a, you know, a wasteful system that you have something around you, but you are putting another way of doing that. So this company called Pivot Bio came up with a microbe which can take the nitrogen from the air and fix it into the into the uh, into the ground. And they reduce the uh, in their second generation product, they reduce the uh, the ammonia consumption by by seventy percent. And hopefully, the next generation will be ninety percent. And eventually, you will just have these microbes which will which will fertilize. From an ammonia perspective that so this is a biotech innovation because of high throughput screening because of industrial fermentation they were able to segregate the microbe but then able to then replicate it in a fermenter and then supply it to farmers in a liquid solution which is going wow. uh, with that so very very interesting uh, sort of automation uh, innovation the third one is a company is i talked about robotics precision agriculture and all of that so there's a company called e-fishery uh, here in uh, Indonesia, a very interesting entrepreneur. Um, this guy, he has been, you know, he's in his early 30s, but he's been doing this for the last 10, 12 years. He's probably had a had, had this uh, as his calling. So he created an IoT device which dispenses feed to fish. And I think all of us know that if you are healthy or you are hungry, you are, the, the biological signals that you send in terms of you might be more grumpy or more happy will be different. The same thing is true with fish. So when yeah. fish are you know, hungry, they make a certain sound. And when they're not hungry or they're sick, they make another kind of sound. So this IoT device, which dispenses feed, is also able to monitor the, the, the different signals that are coming out of there. And by, by monitoring that, the, the feed can be dispensed at the right time, right level uh, to the fish. What this company, so this is a simple IoT innovation, you know, which I call precision agriculture. Because of doing that, you know, these farmers are using 30% less feed. Their incomes have gone up by 30, 40%. The mortality of the fish has gone up because now they can, they can, uh, they can figure out things much faster. Uh, and, and so it's a sustainable thing. It's improving, uh, you know, profitability. It is, you know, more, um, you know, uh, uh, friendlier to the animals that you are cultivating as well. This company has an attrition of its farmers. I think about 2,000 farmers on its platforms has a 0% attrition because once people buy it, they just hooked onto it. Oh, that's um, so, so, you know, again, I can keep on going on and about the kind of innovations that are coming in. This is not rocket science. Alternate protein is obviously an area 
from insect based to cell based to plant based proteins which we have been investing in i'm sure all of you have heard about those as well so mm -hmm. these are the kind of innovations that are happening business model innovations technology innovations which are changing fundamentally the way things are being done mm -hmm. Thank you, Anush. And um, I'm just mindful that everyone's bursting with questions. And before I open the floor to everyone, I just got one more question. It's for all the good backing and investment and good solutions that's happening. Where are the gaps between what the world needs and where the money is going? There probably are still some gaps that people don't call it out enough. Anush, based on what you have observed, where are the disconnects that we need to be particularly mindful about? Yeah, look, the disconnects are not really in the way money is there. Today, actually, un unfortunately, and fortunately, as an investor, unfortunately, fortunately, if you're an entrepreneur, there is just too much money that is ready to go into this space and more is ready to come. I know there are some of uh, the folks over here, Jayesh and others who have uh, raised funds to invest in this uh, sector, rightly so. Um, so um, to, to me, um, the the money is not the issue the real issue is that of you know when it when it's food it's not just the company or the consumer or the farmer which can um, adopt a new technology the entire ecosystem the system needs to be at be changing so whether mm -hmm. the regulators allowing for new food technology uh, technologies whether it is uh, governments allowing, giving regulations for uh, platforms to sell directly to farmers for that exam, for that matter, you know, uh, synthetic biology based, uh, you know, al allowing for certain kinds of rules and regulations to happen. So the, the challenge I see is that startups are coming up with very, very interesting innovations. Large companies are backing some of these startups. They're also doing some things themselves. Uh, however, my concern is is the ecosystem ready to mm. make those changes as fast? And mm. one of the things we are doing here in Singapore as the Masek, as Singapore Food Agency, EDB, ESG, and all of that, is we are really creating an ecosystem for innovation. So Singapore was the first country to approve cell-based meat, Just uh, Eat, which is a portfolio company of the Masek, the first investment we made in the food and agri-tech space in 2014. Um, by allowing for cell-based meat to proliferate uh, or even allow for that, it opens up a huge opportunity for all these startups to come to Singapore and say, I'm going to start up over there. So I think where the lack is, is the intent to allow for the system to unlock because there are some incumbent interests to say, okay, the way it is. Uh, and that's what's going to unleash the, the sector and its potential. Yeah, you're right. It's, it's the growing, it's the processing, it's the transporting, it's the storage, it's the selling, it's it's everything, right? And unless it has to work in tandem, right? Uh, it, it, so everybody has to embrace new thinking and, yeah. and new ways of doing things. Yeah, and thank goodness with Tomasic because um, we've all learned that we've got the Food Tech Innovation Center. So this Asia Sustainable Foods platform is meant to accelerate the commercialization of these companies. Is what you've mentioned. Um, and is it a provision of research and advisory operational capabilities and financial investment as well? Yes, it is. It's all of the above. Basically, our Asia Sustainable Foods platform is to work with food techs, uh, which have a, a good product, a sustainable foods product, where we can both be an investor as well as lean in and help them scale up in Asia fast. So we just don't mm -hmm. want to be an investor who's putting capital. That's, that's there. Uh, mm -hmm. It is also... Uh, helping them in solutions around fermentation, around research, around regulatory approvals to help them scale up fast. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is one of the prongs of the Masik strategy. Uh, you know, we have multiple such uh, different platforms which are doing different things from an investor to an enabler to, a, to an operator kind of model. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the mm -hmm. has a big exposure, uh, Michelle, to this uh, sector. We've invested over, over $8 billion in the last few years in this sector. And it's been a good run so far. Yeah. And people get very excited, Anush, when you hear that you're going to be investing now 30 million over the next three years. But what are the success factors required for, for real success to happen? Yeah, look, uh, again, as an investor, we obviously measure our financial returns. But I think in this sector, we also want to see the social 
uh, benefit and the environmental benefit that comes to the community at large. So we are um, in the process of you know, creating our own impact studies and impact uh, assessments of the companies that we have, whether it's social impact, the people it touch, the consumers, the farmers, and all that stuff, but and, and the environmental impact on how much greenhouse gases were you able to save because you were able to come up with these kinds of products in the market. Um, so, so those will be the criteria of how at least we will evaluate it. That's great. Thank you. Jayesh, all yours, your question. Uh, thank you, Anuj. Uh, very enlightening and really very close to our hearts. Uh, I can't but not ask you this question about the nervousness in the market about Beyond and Oatly. And uh, I'm just hoping that this is a temporary blip, but I'm sure you have more insight than some of us who are just watching from outside. And, and I mean, also tied to that is the frothiness in the valuations. So is this a result of a frothiness in the valuation or is just a blip in operations and it's a quarter on quarter issue? Yeah, look, uh, I think these companies have delivered some soft returns. I don't think it, there is any indication to say that, uh, you know, plant-based products are slowing down uh, because the, if that's the case, then everybody's gotten it wrong. Uh, there are, uh, there is, there was a high expectations getting into uh, getting into the markets and listing. And look, it's it's it, for for startups at this scale. It is uh, I mean bo both Beyond and um, uh, Oatly have grown to be hundreds of million dollars of revenue, but uh, but they are by no means uh, at the point where their growth profile is very clear and defined. I, we all believe there'll be high growth, but can they predict quarter by quarter how that growth will be? I think it is It is still not at that level where they can operate like a Unilever or a Danone. Uh, you know, you should see how Danone gets punished for meeting um, and are missing uh, you know, earnings by 2%. You know that, uh, Jayesh. Uh, so I think these companies are getting the same treatment from the market. Um, I think... Look, valuations is very tough to say what the real benchmark of valuations should be. Before Beyond got listed, there was a different paradigm of valuations that all of investors looked at when we invested in these companies. After Beyond got listed and some of these companies got listed, the multiples moved up. Um, you know, I, I, I certainly believe that there was uh, definitely pockets of frothiness out there. Uh, but you know, when I look at Impossible and some of these companies, they on a year on year basis are continuing to growing at a very, very imp impressive rate. Can I predict them on a quarterly basis? Absolutely not. We don't have that confidence in our private portfolio. I'll, I'll ask you just one more and then uh, we'll see if other people want to ask questions, otherwise I'll come back. But <clears throat> the last time we had coffee, I asked you the same question, so I'll be consistent in terms of asking you about cultivated meat. Uh, you know, I was like a kid when I first found out about that technology a year ago. And I thought I'd put all my money into cultivated meat. Oh my God, this is the best thing since sliced bread. And then as I find out more and more about the deep depth of the technology and what's required, I started getting a bit nervous. And so I'm looking forward to some insights that you have on it now. You've watched this for many, many years now. And do you think that it is really upon us? Yeah, look, uh, I, I agree with you. The more you get into detail and understand the technology, the more you understand, appreciate that it is difficult. Uh, it's not just growing uh, a mammalian cell, uh, historically all the research in mammalian cells has gone into actually creating a protein out of it, not the cell. Now you need to create a cell, you know, it needs to be big enough, then that cell needs to differentiate to either a fat cell or a muscle cell, and then it needs to attach itself to a scaffold where it creates a layer and then there will be multiple layers and then you will come up with a nice little piece of, of steak. Now that is is still, you know, in the zone of science fiction, uh, you know, but what is good is parts of these processes are getting, getting cracked. Um, so, you know, what I expect Jen to see is, is more hybrid products in the market. We have products which have cell-based characteristics, but are also for binding and other things using certain plant-based uh, sources as well. And the main question is the customer acceptance, which I think is likely to be okay uh, with that. So it kind of gives a gradient rather than waiting for the, the, the Ferrari to come in, you will be able to deal with some of the other sort of models of the cars, which are improvements on what you are, what you are seeing. So as I'm talking to a lot of these cell-based companies, more and more they are open to the idea of that the hybrid products coming to the market. And then innovation that I, on, on the cell-based side, 
on the aquaculture side is is progressing relatively well um, from what I see uh, uh, as well. So still a technology which will only be mainstream in a, in a, on, a, on a good case in three years, uh, maybe in five years, uh, seven years, as technology develops, regulatory uh, have been positive. I think the USDA, from whatever I hear from some of the companies, is positively inclined to allow cell-based meat into the market and call it meat. Uh, that's going to be positive. The question then is what product will come into the market. But I, I'm not, I, we are going to invest and we are investing and you'll see some of the deal announcements in the next three months uh, on the cell-based side. Uh, there is a real technological differentiation in these companies. When I talk to Cargill, they think cell-based is the future still. They don't know whether it's in three years, five years or 10 years, but that is still the future. But there are some companies like Aleph and all that, they're already announcing products, right? Cell-based, so how are they doing that? No, the products are being announced, right? I mean, products are being announced, the, the barrier to getting the product into the market and all of that stuff is not very low and every geography allows different kind of uh, uh, products with that. But are these products at a point where you can actually, they are cost effective? I mean, just has been serving these dinners over here in the Singapore, you can sign up for one of these very celebrity dinners and you know, it's, uh, it's a great sort of show. But you know, it hits every time they host a dinner. It does hit their PNL because it's not cheap. So they're not anywhere close to where they can get the product to the market. They have demonstrated that the product exists and it can be in the market. You you can you know you can operate at twenty percent negative gross margin. You cannot operate at thousand percent negative gross margin. Yeah, sure. sure. Okay, thank you so much, Michelle. Over to you. Thanks, Jayesh. Does anyone else have questions? I'm sure you're bursting. I know Amit has got a couple of questions and uh, Brandon, John, please feel free as well. Yeah, I was just uh, wondering if any of our guests have questions, uh, Brendan or John. I, I certainly have a question. Um, Anusha, thank you so much for this. This is one of the better sessions I've joined in, in recent history. This is so fascinating and, and so future looking. Um, I grew up on a farm and uh, and I'm very aware of, of, of some of the older practices and how damaging they were, uh, which gives me a lot of delight to, uh, uh, we've just started investing in a, a project in Australia um, that is doing carbon sequestration, along with being a highly profitable uh, chickpea and sorghum farming operation. And it's the fifth one that these guys have set up that our co-managers set up in Australia and they're doing a terrific job. But one of the things I wanted to ask you was, um, how you're going about factoring in the valuation of carbon credit um, creation when you're investing in an agricultural product, because what we're seeing with the uh, recent rise in the value of, of ACUs in Australia is significant relative to even the rise of the land value. And what we're now seeing is a trend where the land value is actually rising quite uh, significantly in parallel with the ACUs. And I just would love to hear your comments on that. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's it's very interesting, uh, John, uh, what you're saying about these carbon markets in Australia, and I've been watching those as well. It's interesting, you know, Australia has very interesting markets in carbon uh, and in water pricing, water rights and all of that uh, stuff. So it's very future looking in some way. A lot of countries can learn parts of what Australia does very well in the agriculture, uh, uh, you know, system water rights, for example, but, but also these AU uh, carbon markets uh, and how they're sort of feeding the land prices as you explained to it. So look, uh, I don't have, a, you know, um, uh, I would not say I have a very informed uh, point of view on it, but uh, you touch upon, uh, uh, you know, the, the point, uh, we are increasingly, uh, when we are investing in companies which have either a product or technology, where uh, it leads to be leads to a, a good uh, out, better outcome from a carbon efficiency perspective we are increasingly measuring it uh, it takes a lot to monetize it uh, because you need to measure and baseline it you need to bring an agency like gold standard to then then monitor it then you need to value it and then you need to sell it um, we are uh, now we are in both the project development business because several of our companies are developing these businesses, uh, and we are helping them bring these carbons to the carbon uh, to the market through the involuntary market. Uh, in Singapore, the Masik has set, uh, set up something called the CIX, which is a carbon exchange uh, along with DBS and Standard Chartered, 
uh, where we are uh, bringing such projects to the market, uh, where there are bidders who are coming in and they are helping discover the true value of the carbon uh, in these projects with that. Our own internal view, we are, we are as Tamasic, we are putting $40 for carbon today, which is on the higher side from where the markets are trading at. Australia is obviously trending closer to that. Uh, and we believe by the turn of this century, this number will grow close to 100. So that's how we are thinking about it. But we don't factor that into our financial sort of numbers with it. Um, but look, like everything else, all these markets, there will be excesses, there will be there will be downturns. Uh, carbon markets might go ahead of themselves, like we saw it happen in 2007, 8, 9. Uh, carbon markets go ahead of themselves and then, then kind of crashed, carbon pricing crashed. I just hope that this time regulators set in early, get in earlier to control some of these, these markets because they will erode the confidence from, from folks if there's too much volatility in these markets. Yeah, and I, I think one thing, I'm actually in Europe at the moment meeting with commodities traders um, to get their view on, on carbon trading. And I note that all of the large commodities traders um, have set up uh, carbon trading desks now and are actually quite bullish on the, on the pricing going forward. So I think rather than startups controlling the, the, the trading desk, as was the case, as you mentioned, 10 years ago, I think that when you see um, Trafigura and, and Batal and some of these guys coming into the business, uh, I think that that could help with stability um, a, a going forward. And, and certainly I'm in love with the idea of CIX setting up in Singapore because it would be great to see Singapore leading, leading the way here. By the way, one thing I have learned in my trip here is that the Australian card of carbon credits are hugely respected. Um, yeah, it's, it's one of the most the respected and, and well documented among the world. And, and right. as I said, even like the water rights is the only country has it. Uh, the question is, how can they bring others to the market? You know, and Australia tends to be a small market from that perspective with, with very good sort of regulatory uh, or, 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 you know, uh, credibility behind that. So we are keen to learn from the Australian AU market, especially for CIX as well. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks, Anush. Brandon, we see your hand up. Thanks, Michelle. And thank you, Anush. Some really, really great, um, really great insights there. I, I particularly like the idea of sensing hungry fish. Um, it will look, look like we're going to be, have some happy fish out there if we're able to actually sense where their where their hunger's at. And I'm thinking of some of the animal centric uh, systems and technologies that I hear being talked about here in New Zealand. But on that note of how, you know, Australian carbon credits um, um, might be viewed internationally or even how, you know, some of these global challenges that we talk about um, sometimes have, have local solutions. How, how frequently do you see the challenge of, um, you know, translating or scaling up solutions that might suit one farming system, one region, and then trying to scale them up is, is the real challenge. And that ends up being the constraint from an investment point of view. Is that a... Is that a, um, of the investments you don't make, um, how frequent would that be the issue? Yeah, look, by and large, you know, agriculture is a pretty local issue, local crops, local farming practices, uh, uh, that. So especially when it comes to on-field application of, uh, uh, of agriculture in a traditional sort of way. But there are certain technologies that transcend uh, you know, uh, boundaries, uh, ge geographical boundaries subject to regulatory approvals and all of that stuff. You know, controlled environmental agriculture is a good example of that. Greenhouses are proliferating around the world and greater automation is getting into greenhouses. I, I certainly believe that uh, greenhouses are going to be a big part of the future of food, uh, especially given the climate um, um, changes that we are seeing, the climate exigencies, the high rain, the high drought, and so on and so forth. You know, in the United States, 60% of the tomatoes that we consume for human, con for not, not the tomato paste, but the tomatoes that we consume for salads are now produced in greenhouses. So these are some of the technologies that, that transcend where there's a strong technological element to it, which transcend very nicely towards different countries. The greenhouse model is very similar, whether it's in New Zealand uh, or, or other parts of the world. At the same time, when it comes to farming practices, there is two different worlds out there. One is the smallholder world. One is the large scale agriculture world. You know, Australia, New Zealand, uh, United States, Brazil, parts of Europe kind of come into that large scale agricultural work where farmers are sophisticated. They're ready to use large scale equipment, things like that. 
though still quite different sort of practices. And then there is a completely different world, Brandon, of small agriculture, small scale agriculture, which is just a different world altogether in terms of solutions mm -hmm. that you that you offer. Uh, and the small scale size, we are seeing, you know, drones is going to be a big technology for agriculture, for imaging, but also for spraying and all that. So China has taken a big lead in drones. Chinese companies are have created very very interesting drone, drone uh, applications uh, for um, uh, for, uh, for for a variety of this. And Chinese government subsidizes drones now in the market. But now the key is, can we bring it to Southeast Asia and India? India has just allowed for some regulations for agricultural drones uh, recently. So I think it also will be driven by regulatory uh, side of things. So as an investor, we certainly look at companies: can they actually up, uh, be applied to multiple different things? Uh, as well. So, yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Nijam. And ar arguably, there's probably three levels of, of farming between the sort of small holders, um, large scale holders, and then fully industrialized systems, I guess, is the, the sort of um, uh, clarification yeah. points that we often look to. Yeah. Absolutely. But thank you. Yeah. I think John's got a question. John? Yeah, thanks, Michelle. Um, can I change tech a little bit, Anoush? Um, really appreciating all these insights. Um, but just wanted to ask your opinion of the sort of functional food space and where food meets health and some of the trends that you're seeing in that space. Yeah, look, it's a, it's a, it's a tremendous area and which is growing. We are seeing functional foods, nutraceuticals uh, uh, are, are, are clearly growth areas. Um, the main challenge with functional foods has been that how do you um, know that these things work? Um, you know, what is the credibility there? Because unlike pharmaceuticals, where there is a rigorous FDA uh, scrutiny that goes into saying this drug called, you know, cures this, when it comes to a lot of functional foods, it's unclear what is there. Yeah, I mean, a lot of foods will come and say we are omega-3 rich or we are um, antioxidant and all of that stuff. But there is a, a lack of a standard or a, a, and a credibility issue. And these are self-labeling that is out there. So one of the key issues that we have been uh, thinking about is there are a lot of functional foods out there, but can we create platforms to uh, improve the clinical research that goes into functional foods and their impacts on people? Uh, and, uh, and, and as that science develops, that will definitely lead to greater credibility of functional foods uh, and, and, and probably proliferate uh, these uh, these markets as well, but there's some interesting solutions um, when it comes to functional foods. Um, you know, there's a company here in Singapore called Alchemy. It has come up with a with a additive which, when it comes when you can add it to rice, you can decrease the glycemic index of rice without changing the texture or flavor or or, or taste profile of that. Uh, so um, you know, rather than changing the composition of rice because rice is such a specific, you know, you like your sticky rice, your Thai rice, your Japonica rice, nobody wants to change the sushi rice to a brown rice, you know, uh, but if you can decrease the glycemic index, that really helps in elevating diabetes uh, with that. So uh, functional foods, functional additives, uh, and the credibility of, of how these things are really affecting human health are the key questions around it. But right now, consumers are just lapping up on these. That's great, thanks. I see that Maya has joined. Oh, Amit and Bradley. Hi, Maya, good to have you with us. Hey. Bradley. Hi. Oh, let go, Hi. let Bradley go first. Hi. Oh, do you want me to go ahead? Um, thanks, and sorry I, I had to join late. I was um, stuck in another meeting. But um, a, a great topic, and, and, and thanks to, to Ty for, for setting it up. Um, so I'm sorry if, if you've already discussed this, but uh, Anish would, would love to get your take on, you know, what do you think are transformative um, agri-tech technologies that are most relevant for um, 
the developing world. Um, and it, I guess that means especially for smaller scale farmers um, that, that you think could, could scale across, especially around Southeast Asia. Yeah, a lot, no, lot more questions, but maybe I should, uh, I'll, I'll connect with you separately about that. Yeah, no, That's look, I, I covered it, but I will answer the uh, question. I think it's a combination of digital platforms um, enabled uh, on the ground with uh, robotics, AI, precision agriculture uh, technologies. Uh, there are so many such examples where, and, and digitization is already very high in places like Southeast Asia. So the first unicorn I see in Southeast Asia in the agri-food tech space will probably be either a plant-based uh, sort of company uh, because there is just so much uh, interest in that sector, but, uh, but otherwise it will, it will be a digital platform which is enabling um, greater efficiency on the ground uh, uh, with that. So, and, and you know, tools, whether it is, um, I mean, I'll give you an example of a very interesting company I came across in India uh, because you asked for a developing world. So, you know, um, um, uh, what, what this company does is that, uh, you know, in every, for every small hold of farmers, there is always a, a local input produce, input retailer in, in a village or a town. And this input retailer is giving inputs to farmers usually on credit. So this guy uh, usually is a, is, is a family owned business, has been operating for a long period of time. He knows all the farmers by first name. He has their mobile numbers. He knows what land they have. They use, he also knows who that farmer is related to because he might have to go to his relative if he doesn't pay up the, up the black, uh, back debt. He, he knows whether the guy owns some automobile or a, or a, or a scooter or, a, or a, this thing. So he has a lot of information, but he's usually only providing inputs to the farmers. This company, this, um, and we talk about digital, what they do is that they provided a SaaS platform to all these retailers in India, or, or, or let's say this company is at 10,000 retailers. What, and this SaaS platform is free but it has become a customer relationship management tool for these retailers, how to deal with their farmers. And using AI, they have tele, uh, they have ported all the data that was there in literally books to this, uh, this uh, digital platform. So now the question is, so that's great, and but what, what's, what's the magic over here? Because now this company has created this, this SaaS platform for the retailer to deal with his farmers, the company can also now communicate with the farmers when they want to do procurement. So PepsiCo can come to this company and say, I want to buy potatoes during this time of the year. Can you get it for me? And because of their SaaS based platform, they can now broadcast to all these farmers through the, and, and all this data is verifiable. Nobody had to download any app and give any information and all that stuff. That data was there for, for, for tens of, uh, you know, a lot of historical data was there over there. So you can go directly to these farmers, say, hey, do you, want, do you have this quality of potato you want to give it? If you want to give it, go and deposit it with the local retailer, who obviously was a, was a brick and mortar store. And through an outsourced, uh, outsourced service provider, they can go and collect it. So mm -hmm. you know, using an existing value chain, existing system, you have been able to create a reverse sort of feedback loop uh, with that you know, beautiful model, which can be applied. It's being applied to India, but this can clearly be applied to all of the markets because there yeah. are so many such, uh, you know, retailers out there. So that would be my view of what will be the real revolutionary uh, and, and bring a level playing field for small holders. If, can I ask one follow-up? Sorry to be greedy. <laughs> because I, I came in when you were talking about greenhouses and, and I recall that when I was in... Um, Singapore, well, under a year ago, um, that I, I ran across some very interesting um, Singapore startups focusing on um, vertical farming and, and either like close, like um, no input or low input, very like closed systems ways of, of doing it. So it required very few inputs. Um, so that gets to questions of, you know, both you know, being good for the climate, but also um, cost effective too. But the thing is that that's still really quite expensive, right? Vertical farms, right. kind of the promise of that really hasn't taken off. So, you know, if you wonder about these mega cities in Asia or in, in Africa later on, like how, 
how does that become cost effective? How does it work out? And like thinking about the whole supply chain too, and thinking about the whole more broader kind of sustainability loop. Yeah. Right there. The, the unsolved problem for vertical farms or plant factories in a very closed environment with very low consumption of water and land, but uh, still high energy consumption is basically solving two problems. Um, low cost energy uh, and, and renewable energy, which is not very difficult in tropical environments uh, to get to. Singapore has high energy costs, so that's a challenge, uh, but that's not the case everywhere else. Uh, and the second one is really rapid improvement in the genetics of plants. So yeah. plants have been, the genetics that we use today have been genetics that have been used for an open field environment. Uh, and these plants are very sturdy, but they're sturdy. So a lot of their energy and uh, uh, goes into mint, you know, having, dealing with environmental changes. But in a vertical environment, vertical farm, you are so controlled on the environment that actually you can create very distinctive kind of plants using CRISPR, CAS, or even traditional breeding that are very focused on two aspects, you know, growth, which is yield, or nutrition. And our thesis is vertical farms can be used to produce foods that are highly nutritious, which is what the consumer will pay a premium for, and you can grow at a much faster rate. But that will only happen when seed genetics develops, uh, develops it. So we've created a company uh, along with Bayer uh, called Unfold, uh, which was basically a company Tamasic created to just do these rapid uh, innovations in, 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 in seed genetics, only tailored toward vertical farms. I'll, it'll take four or five years for the products to come out. But once they come out, we, we hope not just that these products will be the same that we see it, we can have products which are actually better than the products that we have today from a nutritional side of it. So that is what will unleash the, the vertical farming story. Meanwhile, you know, control environment agriculture to greenhouses is, is probably also a very reliable technology, which is proven on the cost side. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's uh, very fast approaching the hour. In fact, I think we're beyond. And I know yeah. Amit still has questions. So Amit, please feel free to take it away. No, look, I will take this on um, separately. I think a lot of those got addressed. Um, I think the questions that Brendan asked and Bradley asked, I think addressed what uh, you know I wanted to discuss with, uh, with Anuj. But I'm looking forward to more opportunities, Anuj. Thank, I really want to thank you for taking the time and, um, you know, Making it this, making it really interactive and giving your perspectives, and of course, big thanks to um, Michelle for hosting it and for Suda to um, you know set it up and orchestrate it. So thank you for that, and thanks to all the charter members. And yeah, it's been a it's been a wonderful session. Really enjoyed it. Thank you, and see you. So thank you so much for having me here. And uh, look, uh, this is a uh, this is a personal passion as much of my work. And uh, if there's anything. Any ideas folks want to discuss? Uh, I'm I'm active on LinkedIn and uh, and otherwise uh, happy to uh, discuss and collaborate on uh, on new things that you all think about as well. So thank you so much for having yeah, thank, me. Thank you and big thanks to Maya for actually lining this up. I know unfortunately Maya had to travel last minute and she can't be hosting this session, but thanks Maya for uh, for joining and for setting this up and thank you everyone and thanks for all the all the great yeah questions. thanks Anuj. thank you guys thank you um, thanks Take everyone care, Anuj. Thanks thank so much. you Take care. Bye. excellent session bye. guys thank you bye bye bye, bye, -bye. thanks